about the Wilderness Act and what it is we're fighting to preserve, and talk a little, little bit about the state of affairs, and then we'll talk about some future strategies or ideas. So uh, we'll move along pretty quickly here. Uh, how many folks recognize this guy, Howard Zahneiser? Howard Zahneiser is the author of the Wilderness Bill. Uh, he uh, was the executive secretary of the Wilderness Society at the time, and he's the guy who, more than anybody else, is responsible for passage of that law. Zahneiser worked tirelessly for eight years as, a, as its chief lobbyist uh, and the architect of that bill. But the ideas in it aren't just his. He worked with a lot of people, uh, the Murrays, uh, Aldo Leopold before his death, uh, Bob Marshall, and, and others to develop the ideas that are in the Wilderness Bill. Now, when the Wilderness Bill was introduced in 1956, uh, um, Senator Hubert Humphrey introduced the bill in the Senate, the first bill, and, and he introduced into the congressional record an essay that Howard Zahneiser had written called The Need for Wilderness Areas. It's a wonderful essay if you can get, a, get your hands on it and read it. But what uh, Zahneiser said in there is, you know, we have to do two things. We have to establish a system, which this bill does, and then we have to make sure that nothing alters the, the wilderness character of these preserves. And the bill did that too. The bill, the bill contained the provisions necessary to preserve these areas. But we're going to uh, talk for a minute about uh, building the system and how it's gone. Does anybody recognize this character? Stuart Brandborg. Uh, Stuart Brandborg was Howard Zahneiser's right-hand man uh, through much of the debate over the Wilderness Bill. And, and Brandy is the only guy still alive, the only person who was there in the day-to-day -day battles over the Wilderness Act and trying to get it passed. Lives up the Bitterroot, lives in Hamilton, uh, still fighting for wilderness every single day. But uh, Brandy was talking to a, was speaking three years after the uh, passage of the Wilderness Bill, he was speaking at a Sierra Club, uh, they used to have these biennial wilderness conferences where everybody gathered. He was talking about where are we right now in, the, in uh, moving wilderness legislation forward. And I'm going to come back to some of the points he makes here, which is because these issues are still being fought about today. What do we do about areas that have non-conforming structures or activities in them? And if we include those in wilderness, what happens to them and what does it mean for the wilderness system? And it's an interesting question that we're still discussing. But I think the real significance here is the value that they place on fidelity to the Wilderness Act, preserving those ideals and preserving the spirit of that law, and the fact that it was forward-looking. What happens in the future? A lot of people think of the Wilderness Act as a backward-looking document preserving those areas from back there. But it's really, I think, a forward-looking document about what's going to happen in the future, not what happened in the past. Howard Zahneiser used to, used to say it's about uh, taking the eternity of the, of the past and preserving it for the eternity of the future. And I think that's a real significance here. So how are we doing in terms of preserving this great wilderness system? Well, you know, the, the founders of the law, when they talk to Congress, and when you read all the testimony, they envisioned a wilderness system of somewhere around 60 to 70 million acres when it was all filled out. Uh, they had some very specific proposals, and they came up to about 62 million acres, but they had some, some sort of uh, fuzzy language in there, too, that suggested there might be some additional areas. But they thought the wilderness system would be 60 or 70 million acres. Uh, the Senate sponsor of the Wilderness Bill, a guy named Clinton Anderson, who sponsored the bill that actually became the Wilderness Act, he used to say it would be 35 to 45 million acres when it was done. Does anybody know how big it is today? Anybody want to venture a, a, a statement? 110 million acres, just under 110 million acres. So in the context of how we're doing it, building the system and adding areas, we're doing better than I think they ever imagined we would. Uh, but in doing so, it's created some challenges, too. I think challenges perhaps they didn't anticipate, although it seems like you face these, these issues in almost every wilderness. Um, but we've done much better at that. Uh, but I guess the other question, and the thing I want to talk about mostly, is how are we doing in the second half of that equation? How are we doing in making sure that nothing alters the character of the reserves? And in that regard, um, 
I would say, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we aren't doing so well. A little over 10 years ago, the four federal agencies uh, commissioned the Pinchot Institute for Conservation to do an analysis of their wilderness programs and to look at what had been happening in the wilderness system. And uh, you can see what the sort of uh, foundational concern of, uh, of the Pinchot Institute was, uh, that we're not doing a very good job and that, in fact, if things didn't change, the wilderness system could be lost. And I'm here to tell you that things haven't gotten better since the Pinchot Institute released this report. Like so many reports, it got put on the shelf, it got ignored, its recommendations got ignored, and uh, very little changed in the agencies. One of the biggest concerns that the Pinchot Institute found <clears throat> was that there was a lack of commitment to the wilderness program in these agencies. They don't have, they don't have trained wilderness staffs and they don't have nearly enough people, professional people, in those positions. Uh, this was a report that, that the Forest Services Wilderness Advisory Group came out with just very recently about the challenges that wilderness rangers find in trying to be promoted through the agencies. It's a very profound problem. I hear it everywhere I go when I speak to wilderness rangers that they don't have anybody left out there in the field. Uh, so that's a real problem. But there's also a problem that shows up in the field. <clears throat> this is, you know, this is sort of your run-of-the-mill wilderness problem. You know, you can see this trail. Look, I mean, you can run jeeps up and down that. And this isn't on the edge of a town. This is as far as you can get from a trailhead in the wilderness system in the lower 48 states. This is near the southeast corner of Yellowstone and the Teton wilderness. And it suffers with tremendous problems from overuse and misuse that aren't addressed. But it gets worse than that. It's administrators who authorize things that have no place in wilderness whatsoever. This is a Cumberland Island wilderness in Georgia, a National Park Service unit, where they authorize uh, motor vehicle trips, tours, through the wilderness. The, for, the, the Park Service itself was running 15 passenger vans through the wilderness to take people on tours. And, 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 and remarkably, uh, some environmental organizations, wilderness organizations, actually endorsed these tours inside the wilderness. And I don't want to put Peter on the spot, but his organization was one of them. Uh, <clears throat> the, sorry, Peter. Uh, this, is, this is in the uh, Kofa wilderness in Arizona, but this is quite common in desert wildernesses where state fish and game agencies go in and they want to build these guzzlers so that they can have more bighorn sheep because that's a popular species to hunt. And they want to maximize the numbers. And, you know, the Wilderness Act is about not trammeling these places, not controlling them, not manipulating their natural conditions, and yet we go in there and do this kind of activity. Uh, the use of motorized equipment, motorized transport, helicopters in particular, has become very common in wilderness, especially for wildlife management purposes, but also uh, for hauling supplies in and out of wilderness instead of having to use backpacks or pack stock to do that. And, and this whole issue of wildlife manipulation and wildlife management has become a huge issue. I, I'm sure a lot of you probably have uh, read recently or heard about the issues in the river, uh, uh, river no return, the French Church River no return with the state of Idaho sending a trapper in there to wipe out two wolf packs because they think the wolves are eating too many elk. This whole issue of wildlife manipulation is one that isn't being addressed and is getting worse because of stuff like this. This is another example in Washington State, where the Park Service proposed, they, they built these uh, replica trail side uh, shelters in the Olympic uh, National Park, and they were going to hook onto them with a helicopter and take them into the wilderness and plop them along the trails so that campers would have a place to stay and they wouldn't have to get rained on. And uh, the federal court shot this down, and they have shot down many of the, the things that I've shown you here, but that hasn't stopped the agencies from moving forward. This is sort of my favorite. This is a recent one, and it's very live right now. And this was a park or the Forest Service decided to build this replica fire lookout tower in the Glacier Peak Wilderness in, in uh, Washington State. And uh, believe it or not, when that thing was finished, it is now on the National Register of Historic Places. Metal studs, new construction, and all. Um, and when we challenged that in court and, and were successful, the Washington delegation is now trying to push legislation 
to grandfather it in. And it kind of goes back to some of the issues that, that Stuart Brandborg was talking about in his speech to the Sierra Club some 47 years ago about the challenge of these issues. But this stuff is becoming uh, more common all the time. Oh, how much time do I have left? OK, about halfway. Um, so what about Congress? We've talked about the agencies. Uh, I've taken a jab at some of my fellow conservationists. What about Congress, the other lad in this stool? What have they been doing? All this has been happening in plain view. Congress has done nothing. The last time Congress had a, a, an oversight hearing on the wilderness system, a meaningful oversight hearing, was in the early 1990s. It's been over 20 years. I just I laugh when I hear these senators and congressmen talk about how the NSA is doing these things, and we didn't know anything about it. Nobody told us. And I always sit back and go, did you ask? Did anybody bother to, to, to provide oversight, which is what Congress is supposed to do? They've not provided oversight of the wilderness system. And what they have done that has not been helpful at all is they've, they've put language in a lot of wilderness bills, a lot of special provisions in these wilderness bills to authorize inappropriate activities uh, and incompatible activities inside wilderness to make it legal. Those gufflers you saw, those things are written right into bill, a couple of bills in Nevada for wildernesses there. Um, in California, the same thing. And in other places, there have been bills that haven't passed but been proposed in Idaho for the, for the Boulder White Clouds that would have, uh, well, it was what the sponsor called the wolf control language. It would have made what's going on in the river no return sort of the status quo for predator management inside of wilderness. So, and there's been a whole slew of these things. So Congress has not been helpful uh, in putting these language, this, this language in these bills. And in fact, in the 50 years since the Wilderness Act passed, there has not been a single bill that has provided more protection for wilderness than the Wilderness Act did. The Wilderness Act has some compromises in it. Not a single bill has provided more protection than the Wilderness Act did. But many, many bills have been chipping away at the protections. And what happens is, once they put it in one bill, it starts showing up in every bill. So some, some of the wildlife management provisions, the grazing provisions, some of those things that are harmful to wilderness and make it more difficult to preserve wilderness character become commonplace. And it just keeps adding up. And so Congress has been uh, not very helpful. So as the system has expanded, which is a good thing, it has also become less wild uh, by law. And so that's a real challenge uh, that we face going forward. So you know that kind of gives you a, a quick little bit about the history, I guess, and where I think we are today. And I think right now we have a system that's pretty much in crisis uh, with overseeing ag agencies that put a low priority on, uh, on wilderness, on wilderness programs and wilderness protections and a Congress that refuses to fulfill its oversight responsibilities, and frankly, a conservation community, a wilderness community, that pays little attention to these sorts of issues, does very little to defend wilderness against these kind of assaults, and in some cases even advocates for its diminishment. <clears throat> so what do we have to do going forward? I would say it starts with us. Wilderness advocates have to rededicate ourselves to the values and to the protections that the Wilderness Act talked about and to preserving authentic wilderness. It has to be more than a fight over acres and areas or, or over trade-offs and current political favor and using wilderness for political currency. It's about so much more than us. It's about preserving wilderness for future generations and for all the community of life that's out there. It's too easy to take the easy political steps today, but that has real consequences down the road. We have to keep wilderness authentic. Uh, and we have to remember that one of the fundamental tenets of the law is that we humans have to practice restraint. There are a lot of things we want to do out there, but we need to practice restraint. The second thing we need to do is I think there really has to be dramatic reform of the federal agency's wilderness programs. Wilderness is 20% of the public land base. And I'd be surprised if it gets even 1% of the funding that goes into public lands. Uh, it probably gets less. And, and frankly, and this is, this is perhaps a, a bit controversial, but 
I don't think the federal agencies that we have were ever constituted to administer wilderness. They were constituted as sort of multiple use agencies, not that wilderness isn't technically one of the multiple uses, but they're, they're, they're filled with people who, who aren't trained in wilderness, who aren't experts in wilderness, and in many cases could, could care less about wilderness. And it's not to say they're all that way, There's a, there are good people, but the agencies really were never designed to be the stewards of a wilderness system. And I think ultimately we need an agency that is designed to be stewards of the wilderness system. Call it a wilderness service. Call it the overseers of the wilderness system. Uh, fill it up with philosophers and poets and writers and, and authors and, and uh, other people who, who understand wilderness for what it is, who don't feel compelled to manipulate it, don't feel compelled to build things in it, don't feel compelled to drive through it, don't feel compelled to take the easy way out. Don't feel like they have to trade their wilderness responsibilities against their multiple use responsibilities. If we're ever going to see that this 20% and what may end up being 25 to 30 or 40% of the public land base is truly preserved as wilderness, we need an agency that is truly committed to wilderness overseeing it. Um, lastly, what do we do about Congress? I don't know. I mean, our current Congress truly is broken. Our system is truly broken. Uh, that's, a big, that's a bigger issue, I think, than any of us can really fix. But we can work to reteach Congress about what wilderness is. Excuse me. If the people lead, the leaders will follow. We have to become advocates. We have to hold politicians' feet to the fire. We have to insist on more and better attention for wilderness. And ultimately, if we ask for that, it will come. So let me just conclude by saying, you know, the future for wilderness can be either dark or it can be bright. It will be what we make of it. Bob Marshall and his contemporaries complained and bemoaned that they didn't see the wilderness of Lewis and Clark. All of us here bemoan the fact that we don't have access to the wilderness that Bob Marshall did in his era. But future generations shouldn't have to bemoan not having the wilderness system that we have today. We have a Wilderness Act that was given to us. We have a wilderness system that was given to us. We have all the tools we need to preserve a wilderness forever. And there isn't any excuse not to do it. I think the real question is whether we have the vision, the courage, the magnanimity, and the fight to make the changes necessary to ensure that a wild wilderness endures. So thank you. I'll stop there. Well, thanks. Um, it's great to be here. I'm not going to talk about Cumberland Island. Um, I'm actually switch gears a little bit and talk about new wilderness, uh, not really about wilderness management. So I'll wait for a second until oh, this time. There we go. So yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, what I think are some new approaches that are needed to get more wilderness to happen, and I'm going to use examples from two examples from here in Montana. Um, so I will be. Whoa, I think the wrong button. Was that? Okay. Uh, I will be really quick on the history because I think you've probably heard a lot about wilderness history. Um, so can't be up here from the Wilderness Society without at least telling you very briefly the Wilderness Society is a national organization founded in 1935, and as George did well for me, had an instrumental role in uh, the original drafting and passage of the Wilderness Act, and really has been involved in all the major wilderness legislation passed over these last 50 years. Um, maybe you've gotten this from some other speakers here, but you know Montana actually has a pretty unique role in the history of how wilderness has played out over these last 50 years. The biggest probably being in the scapegoat wilderness, which was passed uh, in 1972. When they passed the act in 64, the original thinking was that the agencies were going to be in the driver's seat. And the agencies were going to basically recommend and push through what areas were going to become wilderness. And really what changed that was the scapegoat wilderness, where uh, frankly, a hardware store owner from Lincoln, Montana, decided that uh, road building by the Forest Service in the Lincoln backcountry uh, was unacceptable, and he mounted a citizen-led effort to designate wilderness there, and was ultimately successful after nine years um, making it scapegoat wilderness. 
And really since that point in 72, it started a whole wave of wilderness being kind of a much more small d democratic kind of effort and not really an agency driven process only. The other, the other kind of uh, aspect of uh, wilderness history with Montana Connection is really in the country, the first wilderness area ever designated on BLM lands was actually here in Montana, which is kind of interesting when you think that we actually don't have that much BLM land compared to some other states. And that was in uh, the Lee Metcalf, what became the Lee Metcalf Wilderness Bill in 83, and the Bear Trail Canyon Wilderness. So remember 1983, because um, let's kind of put Montana in perspective in terms of you know, George uh, relayed well with 109, over 109,000 acres, sorry, 109 million uh, uh, acres of wilderness. Uh, we've done well in terms of that, but I guess I'm going to argue that there's a lot more still to be done, and Montana hasn't done very well uh, when you look at it. So this is uh, how much wilderness has been designated by state uh, since 83, both in terms of raw acres and in terms of units. And of course, California, uh, it's far out ahead, and you kind of come down, go down the list with a lot of western states, um, you know, millions of acres to hundreds of thousands of acres. Then you get back to the east, and you have states like New Hampshire with 104,000 acres, and you can get down there to Puerto Rico with 10,000, and then we have Montana with zero. <laughs> and so really, there's no other western state that has gone longer with no new wilderness being designated, and really, I think you could argue we've been in a wilderness drought in Montana. Um, with none uh, over 30 years with no new wilderness designated in the state. Well, maybe it's because um, Montana already had enough wilderness. You know, what about before? What about 64 to 83? Um, this is actually a sign that uh, in a rally that was in Montana for those uh, opposed to wilderness, kind of a double negative in terms of the uh, X and the no wilderness. Um, so let's look at how much wilderness we have by state. Um, Alaska, you know, because of some uh, the Nilkins Mother Laws has kind of the, the largest percentage of its land base uh, in wilderness. But as you go down the list, you know, there's, there's Montana again at 4%, the same as Florida uh, in terms of wilderness. So that's not the answer. Um, really, there's a lot more room for more wilderness here in Montana. And I guess what I'm going to argue tonight is that um, to end this drought with more wilderness to be created in Montana, I think there's a, a need for some new approaches to be taken. And that's really what I'm going to focus on and use two examples, lot very live current examples from Montana uh, to illustrate this new approach that I'm advocating for. Uh, so one being the Blackfoot Clearwater Stewardship Proposal and the other being the Rocky Mountain Front Air Project. And then I'll kind of conclude with some lessons from those two examples. So just to orient you first for, the, for where those two examples are. So this is uh, what people refer to as the crown of the continent, the 18 million acres that kind of is centered around Glacier Waterton National Parks, the Bob Marshall wilderness complex and goes up into British Columbia and Alberta. Uh, don't worry too much about the colors on this, but if you can see them, the, the dark green is designated wilderness, including the scapegoat, the Bob Marshall, Great Bear. Uh, the lighter green is, is Forest Service lands, uh, not, not designated wilderness. Um, and then you have blue, which are state lands and uh, Native American reservations and, and such. So the circle down there is basically just to orient you around Sealy Lake is, is the Blackfoot Clearwater Water Stewardship Proposal area in what's called the Southwest uh, Crown of the Continent. And the Rocky Mountain Front is on the east side, basically. It's this long kind of strip that runs up um, next to Augusta, Shoto, and then that circle up kind of uh, at the north end there, the Badger Two Medicine area, which is uh, the northern end of the Rocky Mountain Front. So I guess to first start with the Blackfoot Clearwater Water uh, Proposal. Um, just to, to kind of zero in on that area, it kind of stretches uh, from the Black, upper Blackfoot drainage, kind of coming from Lincoln uh, down through Ovando, and then uh, the Clearwater area kind of coming down through Sealy Lake uh, in that area. And this area has uh, you know, part of the, the scapegoat wilderness in it, and then it has these other lands that are not designated. And the history here was uh, a history in terms of how this kind of collaborative proposal came about was originally about fights over forest management, um, as we've had a long history of in Montana. But that began to change uh, oh, about eight, eight or 10 years ago, where there were new kind of efforts to say, well, what if we kind of start partnering around new approaches with kind of collaborative forest restoration efforts? 
about dealing with the legacy of old logging roads, about clogged culverts, about needing to thin some forests around communities for wildfire uh, issues. Uh, and you had projects uh, represented here popping up. You also had uh, forest planning uh, go forward, which came up with recommended wilderness, which is in the uh, blue-purple color here, and uh, the agency kind of managing that area for its wilderness values uh, in an administrative sense. Those became the kind of seeds for diverse folks to kind of come together and work on what can we be thinking about this for this whole landscape, um, you know, taking in the whole place, the both watersheds, uh, the public land piece of it at least, in terms of what can be done in terms of its management going forward. And they had uh, uh, agreements in terms of, in a sense, how to think about zoning the, the, the landscape and, and having a proposal where most people's needs could be met whether that was areas for kind of higher intensity forest management, areas for low kind of uh, forestry management, areas that would be managed for their wilderness qualities in a pristine state or as close as possible to pristine state, and then areas with kind of various levels of recreation, some motorized recreation, others non-motorized recreation. So the proposal that came about over many meetings and, and many years of this kind of collaborative had really three elements. And uh, diverse entities that I'll talk about in a second agreed to all of these. The first had to do with forest restoration, which was about uh, seeking and securing, ultimately, uh, new funding for forest restoration projects to go on in that Sealy Lake uh, Ranger District of the Lolo National Forest. The other was, was about wilderness designation uh, and adding 87,000 acres to basically the greater Bob Marshall Wilderness and actually some over on the Mission Mountain Wilderness side. The third had to do with, um, from an economic side with, in Sealy Lake, about cost sharing, support for a cost sharing agreement for cogeneration biomass plant in Sealy Lake, which was in part to kind of sustain um, Pyramid Mountain lumber uh, mill there that was kind of needed for to make the forest restoration element. Um, once that proposal was developed, it was shopped around through a ton of community meetings and public venues. Um, and uh, there were also economic analyses done on the proposal in terms of what it would mean to the community in terms of both you know, jobs and revenues to the local municipalities and the state of Montana. This is just some of the numbers that came up from that. So some of the folks that came together and that ultimately either helped build this or have come signed on as endorse endorsers of it are pretty wide, wide ranging uh, suite of folks, from a timber mill to the snowmobile club to the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation to outfitters to obviously conservation groups and others. Um, and so uh, the Blackfoot Challenge uh, is also another collaborative group. So that proposal ended up, just to where we are today, ended up in uh, Senator Tester's Fourth Job and Jobs and Restoration Act, which has been in Congress, well now two Congresses, for the last almost, what, seven years. Um, so I'm going to switch now and talk a little bit about another example from for the other, uh, the Rocky Mountain Front on the east side of the Crown. Uh, the, this proposal was also collaboratively developed and came about from a group called the, the Coalition to Protect the Rocky Mountain Front that had these kinds of individuals and interests that came together around this landscape. Uh, again, pretty diverse in terms of business owners, <coughs> sportsmen, Blackfeet tribe, uh, conservation groups, ranchers, outfitters, etc. Uh, and the, the one issue that, and the one phrase that you would hear all the time in these very meetings that uh, happened around this proposal and other things for this area is people wanting to keep the front the way it is, wanting to maintain the qualities of how the front what is right now for future generations to continue to enjoy, which if you think about it is in some ways just a restatement of what is intended with designating wilderness uh, and what the Wilderness Act talks about, about preserving untrammeled spaces for future generations. But to be honest, what this coalition came together around was around a threat, and that threat was uh, originally oil and gas development on the Rocky Mountain Front. Uh, this map kind of shows, again, the front, and all the yellow is Forest Service lands that are roadless. So as you can see, it's like 97, 97% of the non-wilderness uh, Forest Service lands are inventory roadless areas. Um, but the roadless rule doesn't say anything about oil and gas leasing or development. It's about road building. 
So there were kind of threats and proposals, multiple proposals, for oil and gas drilling and exploration on the front. And this coalition kind of coalesced around how to fight and stop that, and ultimately was successful. Uh, first, through basically getting legislation developed, introduced into Congress, and then passed in 2006, that was a legislated uh, mineral withdrawal of this, that's the area in purple, the, the lighter purple, for the whole Rocky Mountain front, removing it from any future oil and gas leasing or hard rock mining. Um, but that didn't deal with pre-existing kind of grandfathered uh, leases uh, on the front. And so then there were a series of either buyouts or retirements of those leases uh, on the front. And those are the darker purple, although some of those in the bad medicine parts still remain today and are still ongoing issues. But the coalition formed around this, worked on it for many years, and had these successes. And out of that, there was a kind of an aha moment where it was, maybe we need to think about not just waiting to the next kind of threat to come along, maybe we need to be proactive about what can we develop for keeping the front the way it is and building something um, to maintain these qualities in a, in, again, a, in a proactive way. And so that's where this Rocky Mountain Front Heritage Act proposal came about. Uh, it basically, the folks were really clear, uh, those diversity of folks I mentioned, that they wanted the proposal to be about the whole landscape, about all of the lands, all of, at least the public lands, the federal lands on the front. So the proposal basically covers all, basically over 300,000 acres of federal lands, both those on the Lewis and Clark National Forest and there is about oh, 40, 50,000 acres of BLM lands um, on the front as well. And there's three parts in this, in this piece of legislation, in this proposal that this coalition developed. The first is basically, uh, actually that number is wrong, uh, sorry, uh, 67,000 acres of wilderness additions to uh, the Bob Marshall Wilderness. Uh, and I'll show you that on a map in a second. The second is 207,000 acres to be in a a kind of uniquely uh, defined kind of designated area that this group came up with called the a conservation management area, and I'll explain what that is. And the third had to do with an important issue for this landscape, which is about noxious weeds. So it had some kind of components around management um, of noxious weeds. So just first of all, to kind of orient you on those, those two acreage numbers. So the 67,000 acres of proposed Wilderness additions, new wilderness, are the areas kind of pointed out there in, or we call that teal colored. Um, and the conservation management area is the crosshatched uh, area uh, over the yellow uh, there. And as you can see, it actually, it's hard to see, but it takes in both Forest Service and DLM lands, um, the conservation management area. So, what is the conservation management area, this unique, the 207,000 acres? Uh, well, basically, it ensures that the roadless rule and, and the, road, the, the roadless qualities that we have in the front will be protected over time, uh, not relying on an administrative rule, which is what the, the roadless rule is, but basically legislating that. Um, it does allow some very limited temporary roads to be uh, constructed for forest thinning, firewood gathering, and post and pole, and by very limited, basically, it names four roads uh, in the legislation and says that you can build quarter mile of road off of those four. So it's pretty limited on that. Um, it uh, basically caps and is a, it puts a limit on motorized use. So it does allow motorized use where it is happening today, which is actually not very much of that 207,000 acres, but says that the Forest Service retains discretion to close areas for resource needs if needed, but can never expand it or open areas beyond the current uses today. And unlike wilderness, it does, doesn't say anything, so it allows things like chainsaws and mountain bikes to, to occur in the conservation management area. Then it has, uh, again, the third part is uh, the noxious weed component in this piece of legislation. Uh, it basically has two parts. It directs the agencies to complete a new coordinated weed management plan uh, so that the Forest Service BLM kind of has to work and coordinate with county, state, local watershed groups who are also putting major resources, landowners, into fighting noxious weeds uh, on this landscape. And actually, this part's already had some success in the sense that it's helped already secure um, a uh, federal grant from the NRCS for noxious weed work on the front um, for $250,000. So this, you know, one of the things this, this campaign has done for the, the Rocky Mountain Front Heritage Act is done a good job of really trying to profile the tremendous diversity of folks who built this proposal and are out there advocating for it. So this was from 
uh, an ad that was run about who, who is you know, behind the Rocky Mountain Front Heritage Act, um, just showing some of the different folks, various walks of life, various parts of Montana. Again, like the Blackfoot Clearwater Stewardship Proposal, uh, there's been efforts to also kind of document the support. There was a statewide poll that was commissioned several years ago by a Republican and Democratic poll pollsters together where uh, they asked, uh, you know, the question you can read at the top, where they got a description, a two cents description of the Heritage Act in terms of what it would do, and then asked people's levels of support. And you can see what's interesting, the breakdown is, uh, what I find most interesting is it doesn't matter, you know, it varies somewhat whether they are self-identified Republicans versus Democrats or independents, but that the level of support actually goes up the highest when you when you look at the cross tabs for the, those folks who were in the five counties uh, around closest to the Rocky Mountain Front, 79% versus the rest of the state at 67%. There's also been uh, economic uh, analysis about the, the importance of keeping the front the way it is. Um, we use fish, wildlife, and parks, kind of fishing and hunting uh, uh, data sets to kind of quantify uh, annually how much those bring into uh, the state of Montana in terms of the hunting and fishing resource on the Rocky Mountain Front. So to kind of close here, I guess, what do these two approaches or these two proposals kind of typify in terms of a new approach to wilderness designation? You know, it's, we're kind of past the era, I think, of statewide wilderness bills, as much as I'd love to have that. Um, I think we're in a, in a different time. So we have proposals, these two, as I've explained, that are kind of landscape scale. They kind of, they're looking at the whole landscape in terms of what needs to happen in terms of designation and protection, management, some of it being wilderness, but some of it being about other things. They're place-based. They're about, you know, a, an area that people kind of identify with, a watershed or a place like the Rocky Mountain Front. They are generally collaborative and built from the bottom up in terms of local folks participating from diverse walks of life, uh, not always agreeing, uh, taking a lot of time uh, to hopefully, not always succeeding, frankly, but hopefully getting to a place where they've built something that they can all kind of live with and support. Uh, they, they're not just about wilderness anymore. They're about wilderness and other designations, conservation management area, uh, even the Black Blue Fairwater Stewardship Proposal has a uh, recreation area designation in it. It has those kind of forestry um, components. Um, and, you know, they, restoration, whether that's about, you know, forest management or whether it's about noxious weeds, Recreation are kind of big elements of, I think, this new approach in terms of what people are, are developing um, and as these two proposals typify. So to finally conclude, I guess, in terms of some lessons learned from, from these, um, and, you know, I don't want to say that either one of these has passed. Um, they're both before Congress as we speak, so uh, they're lessons learned with the hopes that they will be successes. Um, I think that there's a lot of power in terms of having multi-component proposals that are not just about protection, but certainly have wilderness in those core protections, but also have elements that are about restoring the landscape and about connecting elements to the landscape. That everyone can see that they're kind of thinking about the whole landscape and protection is a part of that, but there's other things we need to be doing as well. Uh, I think we need to get past uh, as uh, I said with the Rocky Mountain Front and that coalition about just saying no and stopping bad things, of which there's lots of bad proposals out there. Um, in the case of the Front, it was oil and gas. Getting beyond just saying stopping those and saying no to a culture of cooperation about building something new and proactive for the future. And a lot of this is about getting groups are being dissatisfied and concerned about the status quo. And is there a way to build something that provides more certainty for various groups, whether that's, in some cases, motorized recreation users, whether that's about the for uh, timber mill, uh, wanting more certainty about making sure there's still going to be some forest thinning, whether that's about dealing with noxious weeds and having more certainty about coordination across the agencies, or whether it's about more certainty about areas that are being kind of managed as wilderness today but don't have the Wilderness Act kind of legislative protections, that we get that kind of certainty. I think it's super important to make clear the economic benefits. Um, both these proposals have put resources into that, and it, they've definitely, so to speak, paid off in terms of uh, compelling uh, people to look at them with fresh eyes and get behind them. 
And I think it's important to really show the local support that the folks who come together at that local level and, and built these from the bottom up um, make a big difference in terms of getting these moved through the political process. So I think the, the end point, I guess, is if, you know, that this, the lessons learned is that doing this conserves wilderness and wildlife while also can, can also maintain a traditional way of life. And that's what these two proposals, I think, took apply. So, and there. Thanks. issues and have been in the trenches and I represent what George was talking about and that I worked for a federal agency and worked on wilderness issues when they intersected with other issues so I've never focused on wilderness nor did many of my colleagues we addressed it when it came up with other land management or legal issues so that's to start off that I really bring a different perspective here and, I, and I'm all for a conversation of uh, how federal agencies that are the land managers uh, own the federal land that is designated as wilderness, that they're not, there isn't a centralized agency, that there's this overlay of wilderness and the federal agencies can be disjointed and are working on their own, under their own organic acts, under their own legal constraints added to the Wilderness Act and so that it can be disjointed and what a great concept I think to move forward and, and start to pull the agencies together and really focus on wilderness as a central issue. So I, as I was preparing for today I was thinking okay strategies for wilderness in the 21st century. And I really thought of three things. So often we talk about or focus on designation of new wilderness areas, as we should. But really, it should, as George mentioned, involve the preservation of wilderness characteristics in areas that are already designated as wilderness. So we want new wilderness areas designated, most definitely, but let's take care of those areas that are already designated. Let's take care of the wilderness that we have. And then third, to move forward with protecting special places short of congressional action. If Congress isn't acting right now, what else, what other tools do we have? What are other tools do we have to queue up wilderness? Can we look at the Antiquities Act? Can we look at monument designations? Can we look at establishing national wildlife refuges, not as the end game necessarily, but as a first step of protecting special places so that they're there then to um, uh, perhaps uh, move into the wilderness system. So that the three things, designating new wilderness, preserving what we have, and think of strategies for protecting special places. And I have fabulous idea that those strategies of using other tools to protect special places could use a combination of wilderness plus other management prescriptions or other types of protection. So it isn't all one, you know, all or nothing. That it's a combination that can involve communities and on a landscape scale, not just on a state by state political boundary scale. I think we're seeing that on so many environmental, wildlife, climate issues, um, political boundaries are not so helpful. So examples of, I mean, a great timing last week, Congress designating the Sleeping Bear Dunes Wilderness um, in Michigan. And that's the first wilderness designation in five years. Why? What, why, why did that one go and others haven't? I think, you know, it's certainly been a long time still in the making, but there was very little controversy on this one compared to so many in the western states. I see George smiling. Were you involved in this at all? But certainly followed it. it I mean, it's a good thing. But um, 
for the first in a while. Uh, so then backing up from Sleeping Bear Dunes just past last week, prior to that, was the Omnibus Public Land Management Act of 2009. Actually, looking back on it now, quite extraordinary um, that it designated. So it was this, it was a, a public lands package. And I wonder if that's not the way of the future of putting all of these um, proposals together. So it's a whole package, not just, and I'm not saying that just wilderness, but wilderness in addition to other designations. So the Omnibus Public Land Management Act added not only millions of acres into our wilderness system, but established a national landscape conservation system, designated new national conservation areas, added to our national park units, natural heritage areas, new reclamation projects, really broad ranging. But in being so broad and in doing so much, it was not easy to pass. It's passed by the skin of its chinny chin chin. But it also included some things that weren't so um, palatable to a lot of groups. There were a lot of um, additional, um, they weren't riders because it was all part of this. But, but it was so comprehensive that um, you know it had pros and cons to it. And, and was that the reason it passed? I don't know. We'll get to my third, uh, second example of taking care of preserving the wilderness areas that we have in place. I'm going to bring up the example of the Eisenbach National Wildlife Refuge. And um, that discussion goes back to this bill. Part of this bill included a provision for the Secretary of the Interior to study and consider a land exchange with the state of Alaska and um, the road to nowhere, a road across the Eisenbeck National Wildlife Refuge and Wilderness Area. So that was part of what was included in this package. Uh, so then a specific example of wilderness designation. Uh, the Point Reyes National Seashore, that should say, Point Reyes National, Point Reyes Wilderness. So this was a recently designated wilderness, but it wasn't a congressional action. The reason that Point Reyes, um, that we were uh, able to designate wilderness in the Point Reyes National Seashore was it was the result of a 1976 act that designated thousands of acres as wilderness, but also allowed 8,000 additional acres to be designated as wilderness once the non-conforming commercial uses ceased. So, um, and this is ongoing, it's just been applied to certiori appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. So what happened with Drake's Bay Oyster Company versus Jewel, so what happened with the designation of this wilderness in the Point Reyes National Seashore was that at Drake's Bay, who's ever had Drake's Bay Oyster? Yeah. Pretty good, aren't they? <laughs> I can't say, I, so I worked on this and um, went to California a number of times with the Secretary of the Interior and love oysters, but definitely did not want the photo op of the Secretary's attorney slurping up Drake's Bay. Fabulous Drake's Bay oysters. Um, but not that I wasn't tempted. So there was an um, oyster company that was operating under a special use permit within the um, national seashore, within the lands that would be designated as wilderness once this commercial use ceased. So the special use permit was coming up for expiration. Congress had gotten involved, and um, Senator Feinstein actually was a huge supporter of the Drake's Bay Oyster Company. And uh, Congress passed in a rider that the Secretary of the Interior had the authority to renew the special use permit. Arguably, certainly the uh, Department of Interior argued that did not require the Secretary to extend the special use permit, just gave him or her the authority to, um, to do that. So Secretary Salazar 
traveled to California, um, talked to many people about this, was, I think, took it very, very seriously, took it to heart, because, um, I mean, for a number of reasons, mm -hmm. that mm, it was an agricultural use that I think is compelling. You know, were there huge environmental consequences to it operating? The science was not clear on that by uh, not allowing the special use permit to continue, to have it expire on its own terms, put a number of people out of business. He certainly took that to heart, but ultimately uh, determined to let the special use permit expire and then the next day issued a decision and the next day published in the Federal Register notice of this um, being a wilderness designation. So the oyster company challenged the decision and the district court in California first, they asked for a preliminary injunction stopping the uh, wilderness designation from going forward. The district court jumped in and, and did not grant the injunction. The parties faced by Oyster Company, and now it's become a cause celebre. Certainly Alice Waters filed an amicus brief. You know, a lot of um, parties have gotten involved in this. Uh, asked for the Ninth Circuit to intervene. The Ninth Circuit to, um, ruled in favor of the Secretary of the Interior. Then the parties asked for the Ninth Circuit to review it on banc, which means a whole um, panel to review it. And that panel denied the, um, the injunction as well. Then the parties have now appealed to the US Supreme Court. And the operations are ongoing until or unless the Supreme Court either denies certiorari, which means it's over, or um, weighs in. So it definitely continues. So what does it tell us? Um, you know, what do we learn from this example? I think it's somewhat unusual. It's different from um, legislation, current legislation and collaborative efforts in this, and that this really was a result of the 1976 Act. And you don't have a lot of collaboration. You have one use that conflicts with the wilderness characteristics, and you have to shut it down. And so I think that it's, it's a product of an older statute and um, one use in one area. But it demonstrates just how difficult it is to designate wilderness, how many people weigh in, and that it's a torturous legal route. Um, through the courts, that it's not easy. Would you agree with that? Yeah, we talked, we had, a, the conversation we had at dinner today, tonight, the three of us, if we can have at the end of this, that's probably the best of, of everything. So um, this was actually uh, a moving moment for me. This is when I traveled with the secretary when we went to look at the Estero and how many people have you been, have been there on a sunny day? Yes, one person. Well, I were probably the only two people in a wide range who've been there on a really sunny day. And it tells you the power of wilderness, I think. When we went up to this point and looked over the Estero on this gorgeous sunny day, you know, I, I believe in agriculture and, and certainly you know, local food, sustainable agriculture. When you went up to this point on this sunny day and looked out, it was remarkable. And it gave all of us pause. We realized, oh my goodness, this is a special place. This deserves special protection. It's unlike others. And I think that's, you know, to remember the place of wilderness in this whole toolbox. That there's so many different ways to preserve special places, but none is quite like the wilderness staff. So the, the Secretary's decision on Drake's Bay was based on policy implications, not science alone. And that's what the courts are upholding, his implicit discretion to make a decision on these policy implications, really the wilderness policy implications. So then how about preserving wilderness characteristics in designations that are already in place? The second strategy, here's a picture of the Eisenbeck National Wildlife Refuge. And uh, 
that is also incredibly, it's different from a lot of the challenges where there are day-to-day -day operational decisions that are in regions or in fiefdoms or, you know, in a, in a national park unit or on a specific national wildlife refuge. This, I think the feeling was the proposal that the, um, first the director of the Fish and Wildlife Service and then the Secretary of the Interior had to look at was whether to exchange lands within the Eisenbeck National Wildlife Refuge with the state of Alaska, and that would allow a road to be built from the village of King Cove um, across the isthmus. And, and it was couched as a concern for native natives in the village of King Cove to um, get medical access, to be able to evacuate. There was no land route out. They get flown out, and there had been some accidents. So that pits, you know, it's easy for us to think about when we're wilderness advocates or you care so much about the wilderness characteristics, it's always, it's, you know, balanced, at least in this instance, with some health concerns as well or native um, village, uh, their ability to get medical attention. But to weigh it all together, they, um, the road wasn't going to probably help that much really the road to nowhere and that the wilderness characteristics and the Eisenbeck National Wildlife Refuge, the wilderness there, so extraordinary and really would be impacted by a road built through there. There were questions of whether the road would be used then to get um, what, uh, frozen king crab through, you know, would it start to be used more and more and how would that erode the wilderness characteristics at the Eisenbeck National Wildlife Refuge. So big issues, um, you know, not easy decisions, big political ramifications to this. And we will see those um, as time where, um, plays on. So, and powerful senators from Alaska that um, can they block judicial nominations, can they block other nominations, What's the political toll of doing something like this? And ultimately, the Secretary of the Interior went to King Cove and looked at this. I had just come here to teach, otherwise I would have gone with her and really wanted to go there. But um, uh, ultimately, made the decision to not approve the road to be built through the wilderness and not approve the land exchange. And that has not, I don't think that's been challenged yet. Do you, um, do you have that been challenged yet? It's just come down, um, and it would be challenged probably on the on the NEPA basis, would be my guess. There's legislation. Oh, is there already proposed legislation? Well, so then, okay, well, I mean, that's the, the elephant in the room also. I think for wilderness designations, and then wilderness designations that are, the, that are already in place, they're congressional designations. So Congress has the ability to put wilderness, to protect wilderness, but also to make exceptions, exceptions when they're designating the wilderness, or like for um, Jake's Bay Point Reyes, to make exceptions for special use permits. So here, you know, there's a proposal then to undo, um, do that decision to deny the road and the land exchange. So then uh, the third point, the third strategy, I think, is how then to move forward with s saving special places in a time where Congress isn't acting. I thought there were, I had read something that there were 24 wilderness bills before Congress, that's plus or minus, um, that, that haven't moved. Um, so what other tools are available? Can we start moving forward with saving some of these places? in other ways, um, queuing them up. I mean, think of Grand Canyon National Park was originally a monument. We have other monuments that have then gone on to be um, national parks. So we, you know, it can be a step-by-step -step process. It can be. Obviously, you need to preserve the wilderness characteristic of, of the place. So uh, another example of just last week, the president designated Point Arena Stornetta unit of public lands in Northern California as a national monument. So are we 
he's seeing? Is the um, President Obama stepping up to the plate and starting to use the Antiquities Act more and designating more national monuments? There's certainly, um, he has said, he has indicated that he would do that more. The Secretary of the Interior read her speech before the National Press Club certainly indicated that she is willing to look into that more at the president's direction. Obviously, the president under the Antiquities Act, the president is the one who makes the designation, and she carries it out. But um, certainly, I think that we're hearing um, indications from the administration that they're willing to do that more, that they're realizing there's a place for them to step up to the plate and designate and save these special places where Congress is not acting. Um, when I think that the President has said that there's a moral duty to leave our lands and waters and wildlife in a better place than they are today. So how that plays out, the proof is in the pudding of how it plays out. So here's an example, though, I think, of uh, Secretary of the Interior and the Blackfoot this weekend trying to get full funding for the Land and Water Conservation Fund. So the, the end um, result here, or the thing that I want to finish with, is it's coming up with a public lands package, coming up with wilderness bills combined with other designations and other issues and putting it all together. And so I know she's thinking, well, full funding for the Land and Water Conservation Fund, for example, it is part of that. So the full suite that should include wilderness designation, amongst other designations. So. very much for uh, the, your attention as well as for three wonderful perspectives on this issue. We'll now open it up to uh, questions and answers from the uh, questions from the audience. Um, I'll bring the mic around for those who have them. And please, uh, if it's directed to one particular person on the panel, please indicate as such. Hi, uh, this is Peter. Um, I'm from Shoto, Montana, uh, where the Heritage Act, the Rocky Mountain Heritage Act, Goals. I mean, you said it's supposed to be rolled this and stuff like this, but uh, from my understanding, especially what you showed there, uh, Teton Pass Ski Area, um, a bunch of outfitter uh, places are behind that line. Uh, my cabin is behind that wilderness line, so how can you call it roll this and how can you um, turn it into wilderness when it is developed, it is trampled and such? I can put the map back here. A little bit, or maybe could you uh, put more description where yes. that uh, world peace line lies? Because I know most locals around there are not for that at all. Well, uh, a lot of people are going to see what you showed up there. Is that working? No? Yeah, no, it's working. So, I, I could put up the map again, but. Just to be clear, the, the, the boundary of that conservation management area, that's what probably takes in your cabin, the Teton ski area, outfitter camps, and uh, none of that would be in any of the proposed uh, wilderness additions. All of the areas that are the 67,000 acres um, that were basically in those five uh, kind of additions to the Bob Marshall Wilderness are all areas that frankly are already recommended by the agency as wilderness and are being managed that way now, and none of them have uh, what's the word, any non-conforming uses like cabins or, or <coughs> ski area or things like that in them. Um, in fact, the agency has actually gotten uh, closer to about 90,000 acres that they recommended for wilderness. So there were a lot of compromises and groups like mine start, and others uh, started with a, with a much higher number about uh, where those wilderness boundaries should be drawn and compromises had to be made in terms of from folks from the local area saying, we don't think that should be wilderness. We think the line should be moved back here. And this conservation management area was frankly developed from the discussions that went on with the 
thought that uh, there should be a way to kind of have a designation that basically doesn't, it's not wilderness, it's something else that basically leaves existing uses as they are, but would not allow brand new kind of uh, non-conforming uses to come in. So uh, people with um, cabin leases on the national forest or on the BLM lands or the ski area, or even the ski areas, uh, Teton Pass's ski areas intentions about wanting to expand as they have, would not be affected. The benchmark airstrip. I mean, we went through all of these kinds of issues with local folks. Um, in terms of the, the, the second part, I think you're getting at about how much support is there at that local level. It's divided. I mean, there have been, uh, Senator Baucus, before he introduced the bill, held five listening sessions on the front in Augusta and uh, Helena, Augusta, Shoto, Great Falls. Uh, and then Congressman Daines has been up there with listening sessions. There were the coalition before that had uh, uh, various kind of public forums. And certainly there were people who got up from the local level who did not want any new wilderness, did not want any designations at all. However, when we pressed them, and we've had lots of meetings with Teton County commissioners, um, with other ranchers, you know, we've really tried to work with this proposal about trying to address any valid kind of concerns about how people's current uses would be impacted. That we can work with. Where it's hard is when people have an ideological, um, you know, some days they have an ideological resistance. They don't want even to have public lands. They'd rather have some of those lands not even be national forest lands. Or they don't like the idea that they're currently roadless and are being managed that way as it is. Or they have concerns about how the Forest Service is currently managing their endangered species program or their grazing program or things like that. And we decided we're not here to try to fix everyone's kind of either ideological or other issues with land management. We wanted to basically create something that was just about keeping it, again, I, I say it as I did in the presentation, keeping the front the way it is. But, you know, some people came around, others still oppose it to this day. So I, I you know, I'll be clear that there is, um, you know, the numbers I gave were, were from a statewide poll, um, but there's a lot of support the same time. I mean, uh, even some of those, uh, the numbers when Congress, the most recent one, Congressman Gaines, when he held his listening session, uh, I guess it was about a year ago in, in Shoto, it was about just over almost two thirds of the folks who got up and spoke um, were in support. But there were over about a third that were opposed. Yeah, I'm not against the list, but I'd hate to see it lose my cabin because it's more than yep. fine. Well, I'm happy, you know, afterwards I'm happy to talk to you more, give you a more detailed map. Other questions? Uh, this is also for Peter. When you mentioned uh, Montana being pioneering and having the first uh, citizen proposed wilderness and was the other wilderness, I thought you were also going to say that uh, we have the Mission Mountain Tribal Wilderness, which I understand is not a federally designated wilderness area. But, um, what is, why does the Wilderness Society stand in relation to the tribes in terms of collaborative partners? Uh, and do you see um, that as a, as a sort of vehicle for some sort of alternative wilderness-like designations? And then maybe at the end you can just explain, what did you mean that the era of statewide wilderness designations is over? Sure. So I think there's two, two different questions there. Um, in terms of collaborating with tribes and about tribal wilderness, um, I don't know all the details around the mission, uh, the tribal mission mountain wilderness. There's other examples actually in Wyoming. There's the Wind River, the, the Shoshone Arapaho tribe in the Wind River Range has their the designated wilderness um, on their reservation that goes into the Wind Rivers as well. Um, but to the larger point about collaborating with tribes, we certainly have done that. Um, you know, the the early uh, kind of threat that built this kind of coalition around the Rocky Mountain Front in terms of oil and gas. The Blackfeet tribe was, was quite involved around that. We're still working with the tribe. There's still oil and gas issues um, there. The tribe, I'll be honest though, the Blackfeet tribe, um, I think wants to see an area like the Badger Two Medicine ultimately return to their ownership, um, or at least some of the tribe do. Um, whereas others are, you know, would like to see some or all of that area uh, protected as wilderness or other things. There have been examples I'm familiar with in other states like New Mexico where there's been what's called cooperative management agreements struck where 
the land stays in federal ownership, but that the tribe gets some sort of um, uh, kind of more explicit role in co-managing the, 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 that, that, that land. Uh, and that's something I think that the, I'm guessing that the black parts of the Blackfeet tribe would be interested in for the, the Bad to Medicine portion of the front. You know, I think the devil's in the detail. We'd be, for the Wilderness Society, we'd be interested in having that discussion and exploring possibilities there, but it's kind of hard to give a, I guess, a um, catch-all statement about we will do whatever tribes want or we, you know, we're against whatever tribes want. It's, it's neither one of those. I guess it's, it's based on, on a specific case. Um, I do think it's an important question, though, for especially when you look at Montana and some of these areas, especially in the Crown with the with, with Blackfeet and with the um, Salish Kootenai. And the other part of your question, um, I guess what I meant by the era of statewide wilderness bills being over is, you know, there was a period uh, kind of starting in the 70s and the 80s and probably ending in the 90s where pretty much every western state would go through based off of agency inventories of uh, either BLM or Forest Service roadless areas, uh, a bill for that was for the whole state. It wasn't about a specific like watershed or place. It was, you know, uh, the Utah, you know, all the forest, you know, looking at wilderness across national forests uh, 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 all over Utah or in Colorado or in Wyoming. So many of those bills were passed, and they, those were the bills that created millions of acres all in one fell swoop, basically, in those states. But as someone can correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think we've seen one of those kinds of bills go through. Uh, I think the last one I'm familiar with in terms of the statewide wilderness bill is actually for Virginia. Um, and I think that was in early 2000s. But most, you know, when Martha listed about 20, I think there's like 28 bills, wilderness bills pending in Congress, I don't think a single one, there's, there's one called the Tennessee Wilderness Bill, but really it's only about one, it's like, what is it, like 38,000 acres. It's about one portion of Tennessee. So when you look at those bills in Congress right now, not a single one of them is what I would, what I'm kind of terming or thinking of like that old style of big hundreds, thousands of acres to millions of acres statewide wilderness bill. And instead, what we're seeing are these ones that are on kind of smaller kind of areas. There's certainly multiple bills like that in Colorado, California right now, Washington State. You can kind of go down the list. Yeah, someone else should speak. We we were talking about if dinner and a little bit now whether even some of the larger wilderness bills that are more than one landscape, really, their landscapes combined, whether those are um, going to go through now or whether at some point it might be more helpful to break them down into more landscape-specific bills. This one's for George. Um, do you speak of our need to revamp the uh, wilderness organizations and fill them with people who generally care more about the wilderness and the character of the wilderness instead of trying to alter that? So what would be some first steps to uh, bring about that change? Well, um, I mean, I think the, uh, one of the things that could be done in the short term, I think, is to is to um, convince the agencies that they need to build up their wilderness cadres. They need they need to hire people and they need to, to develop career ladders so that people in a wilderness program can hang around for a while and, and rise up to levels, decision making levels, where they can make good decisions for wilderness. Um, and that probably would requ will require some nudging from Congress because I, I just don't think the leadership in the agencies is interested in doing that right now. They have other priorities. Um, but ultimately, I, I think in the long haul, it, it actually is going to require an agency that is committed to wilderness. Administering wilderness uh, is different than other things. And um, I just don't think that the, uh, you, you can't serve too many masters. And in the agencies today, you have to serve too many masters. Um, and so imagine if the people in the Fish and Wildlife Service who oversee the Endangered Species Act also were responsible for getting out the cut, uh, you know, uh, appeasing the fish, state fish and wildlife agencies, you know, 
getting all the cows out there, go on and on and on and on, down, issuing all the mineral lease stuff. Uh, you'd have a whole different group of people in there that maybe weren't nearly as committed to, to endangered species and also didn't have time to deal with them. And that's kind of where wilderness is right now. Um, and so I just think that we need uh, a different sort of approach in, in a very big way. So I guess this question is for all three of the panel members. But um, so George, you talked about you know wilderness heroes such as Aldo Leopold, Bob Marshall, Cecil Garland, Dallin, the scapegoat. Peter talked that we haven't had wilderness for 30 years since 1983 designated here in Montana. And so I guess when I think about this talk about strategies for the 21st century, what kind of advice do you have for this generation to be the next wilderness heroes? What does this generation that we see in this classroom? need to do to become those conservation heroes so we can get wilderness designated. Is that they have too much time focusing on other issues besides wilderness? So back in 64, we didn't have wilderness designated, so we fought for it. But issues today like climate change, fracking, energy production, megaloads coming to Missoula, is that a deterrent to getting wilderness designated? Um. It might be. I mean, there, there are, I think we all see more issues out there today that are threats than, than I certainly did when I first started working on wilderness. I thought if we just could designate all the, all the wildernesses, everything would be right in the world. And probably isn't true. I'd like to give it a try. But um, I think that, uh, I think part of it is, in, in terms of designating wilderness, I think what's harder today is influencing members of Congress has become more difficult. I mean, the reason Montana doesn't hasn't had a wilderness bill since 1983, probably 95% of that is Max Baucus. Max Baucus wasn't willing to to jeopardize any political support to pass the wilderness bill. That's why all these other states had wilderness bills. They were dealing with the exact same Congress, and some of them were willing to stick their neck out. Some of them got their necks chopped off but they were willing to make a stand and try to pass the wilderness bill. He had the power he could have, and if, if he'd have been like a Bob, Barbara Boxer in California, we would have had a lot of wilderness bills passed in Montana. I'm, I'm confident of it. But that said, it's, it's just, I don't know exactly what the secret is anymore, because it's just very hard to influence a member of Congress now. They don't come out here. We were talking over dinner and how wilderness bills changed. You know, in 1984, when I was working on the Utah Wilderness Bill, the whole committee, uh, or the subcommittee came out, and they went into the wilderness. And they looked at all the areas. They, they had helicopters, unfortunately. They couldn't helicopters. They didn't land in these areas. They didn't land in these areas, but they used them to get around the state. So they could see all these areas that were proposed for wilderness. And then our delegation held a number of hearings around the state. Um, there were all these opportunities for the public to engage, and they drew up a bill, and there was a hearings in Washington, and lots of back and forth, and eventually we had a bill. That just doesn't happen anymore. These bills pop up in Washington, D.C. They're debated in Washington, D.C. You have these perfunctory hearings, and maybe somebody can figure out a, a, a good political strategy to get it passed, to get it attached as a writer on some other bill or build a big omnibus bill and insert it in. It's, I don't know, it's just a tough thing, uh, uh, I think, right now. And I don't have any magic. Just fight for it. Get out there and fight for it, and uh, hopefully you'll find the solution. Uh, the way Willers Bills have passed have changed a lot over the years, and I don't know what will work next year or the year after. Uh, I guess my advice would be that I think wilderness is still uh, even more so relevant in terms of our kind of busy, crazy world that there's, there's, if you're a student, there's some kind of, um, you know, value in terms of being able to get away from all the things that kind of grab our attention. I also think in an era of climate change, and if you care about what climate change is going to mean, which I think you should if you're a, a, a student today, uh, wilderness has a real role to play in terms of helping our landscapes be resilient and to be able to adapt in an era of changing climate, especially in a place like Montana with large landscapes like we have, like the crown of the continent. Um, I guess my advice would make sure you know what wilderness is, get out in it, um, and then also kind of have discussions with people who don't know about it or have different views than you about it, so that you're able to kind of understand the different perspectives. Um, and kind of truly try to listen, I think, to some of those different perspectives, whether that's 
you know, those who don't understand why there's any need for wilderness or who don't understand why they can't ride their mountain bike in it and think that's unfair or, you know, appreciate the kind of uh, hunting experience that they can have in wilderness that they can't have elsewhere, kind of just truly kind of understand the, the larger kind of demographic, social kind of um, perspectives that people bring around wilderness. And that will set you up, I think, for being effective uh, to get as I was I've argued more wilderness to happen in the state. I don't know how to add to that. Well said. Um, I think to just remember, as I was going through this, that wilderness designation necessarily involves an act of Congress. So, right, you're dealing with Congress in today's world, and looking through the omnibus acts that have gone through or slipping bear dunes, the wilderness that has passed, it's either not controversial, combined in a package with, with you know, some controversial parts to it, but not fully. And these collaborative efforts, that as difficult as they are, I think it would be incredibly hard to pass any wilderness designation now without some sort of collaborative effort. Even if they're difficult, I think that they're necessary. And then just to remember that um, wilderness is part of the toolbox and that there are other tools that we need to be using as well. And maybe that's what gets people outside, gets Congress to understand the importance of place and wilderness in that place. But, and everybody being committed. So we have time for just one uh, final question, and I saw Rob's hand up first, so we Rob Cheney from the Missoulian. One tool that none of the three of you have brought up is uh, NREPA, which has been around for so long I've forgotten what it actually stands for, except that it's the nationwide uh, or all over the country bill uh, that includes a whole bunch of the remaining designated proposed wildernesses. Proponents argue that it makes wilderness a national issue that ought to get beyond the, uh, the state delegation parochial divisions. Opponents say that it's uh, never going to pass and it's sucked off a crucial percentage of the uh, uh, voting public who would otherwise support local initiatives and has just helped stall the effort. Uh, I'd be curious what all three of you think about Enrique's fate and uh, influence on the day. So I think it's the Northern Rockies Ecosystem Protection Act. Um, it covers five states. It's actually not national, um, but it, yeah, it's Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, I think parts of Oregon and Washington. And you're right, it's been around since, gosh, the early 90s, I want to say. Um, in Congress, uh, and it basically would proposes designated wilderness pretty much all the roadless lands in those five states, or not all of Oregon, Washington, but a portion of the Oregon, Washington, Eastern Oregon, Washington, and the Northern Rockies. Um, you know, I think it's played at a, at a certain point in history a useful role in terms of it's very big and bold and visionary uh, of getting people. Uh, excited about what could be done and the, in reminding them of the, the incredible remaining kind of wildland resource, we, unprotected resource we still have left in the Northern Rockies. Uh, I guess in terms of, you know, the role it's playing today, I, you know, it's, I think it's still in Congress, but um, I'm not sure it's really realistic to think that it's going to be one that's going to be put in any sort of package, uh, as Martha's described. Um, it certainly wasn't part of the 2009 omnibus. Um, it just doesn't seem like it's had a, a big, sustained, diverse coalition behind it. Um, you know, I guess, officially, I guess I would say that if we can get to something like the kind of the bold, large landscape protections that Enrico kind of is putting out there, but through place by place kind of steps, um, that's, you know, from, from where I sit, that's fine. And I do think like, you know, the, the Rocky Mountain Front Air Jack is a small little piece of what you might find in it. It's, it's different though in the sense that, you know, uh, Enrico of course would designate all of those lands as wilderness um, on the Rocky Mountain Front, whereas the Heritage Act, as I've described, 
you know, has a pretty small wilderness component, really, 67,000 acres, and then this larger other unique designation of the conservation management area that was built up um, at the local level. So they definitely are not, they're definitely coming from different places in terms of how they're building the, the detailed proposals on the ground. Yeah, I would say Naripa was very uh, unique in wilderness bills when it was introduced in the sense that not only was it big, uh, it covered something like 23 or 24 million acres of wilderness in the five state area, but it also talked about uh, restoration. It had restoration areas. It had biological corridors. When biological corridors were just starting to be talked about in, in conservation biology, and there were conservation biologists who were very involved in the drafting of NARIPA. So it, it's, it's a wilderness bill that is, that is designed to try to preserve North ecosystems, uh, not just places, but uh, uh, all of the different things you want to try to preserve to keep the species and the, and the wildness of the areas intact. Um, you know, political chances are what they are. Uh, I think it serves as a great vision, uh, even now, to look at other bills and see how they stack up. Uh, who knows what the future will hold for, uh, uh, for bills like that. Um, politics changes, you never know. Um, you know, right now, very few, I, I wouldn't bet a lot of money on any wilderness bill passing right now, except maybe, <laughs> maybe sleeping bear sand dunes, which passed. But, um, but it's a great, it's a great vision, and, and uh, uh, it, it's definitely worth taking a look at. And it's been introduced in this Congress, and as Peter said, it's been introduced many times since about 1990 or 93 or something. <laughs> think of our existing environmental laws and some of the landmark bills that were passed years ago or in the 70s and in some sense a visionary bill is very appealing because I think it's something we haven't done for a while but I worry about our public lands and the West and the repercussions. Um, I think of the bills in Utah or the discussions of transferring federal lands to states and some of the backlashes um, potentially against the Endangered Species Act. I think that counsels, um, in some respects, to work on the landscape base um, and, and build coalitions versus doing something sweeping. So there are pros and cons to it. But it's always heartening to know there's something like that out there. Well, thank you very much to our panel, and thank you to everyone for coming tonight. Let's do a panel of applause.